Um, sorry, I'm, I'm just gonna, it's, it's just warming up. So, um, so we decided to do this, um, this event as a collaboration between Art Science Salon and Arts, the Art the Science, and Julia will uh, elucidate uh, you in details later on. Um, but as soon as we announced uh, that uh, we were uh, doing something about algorithmic art and sci-art and, um, sci and algorithm and the role of sci-art and algori algorithms, uh, immediately I started receiving some I shouldn't say hate mail, but some people criticizing uh, the role of algorithms in our life and how we could dare talking about art and algorithms without considering other issues. So, um, so I went and I, and, and I did a little bit of research and uh, I was trying to find a definition of algorithm and uh, there is no single definition of it. People have been discussing this for a long time. Uh, what we know is that it consists of a series of specifications of how to solve a uh, class pro of problems. Computers run algorithms. Uh, AI contains algorithms that behave in a way which can be deemed intelligent, depending on your perspective, I guess. And uh, it is something that is still under discussion. I guess, too. So um, what is important about algorithms uh, today is that they are ordering big data, uh, like consumer data, as we know from Facebook and uh, social networks, environmental data, which are very important and we will hear about today, personal data, and other data, like medical data, et cetera. So they are so ubiquitous that uh, today uh, we've also come to define uh, this uh, algorithms everywhere as algorithmic governance. And uh, Luciana uh, Parisi in her book defines algorithmic uh, governance as the infallible execution of automated order and control. Sounds a little bit scary. So of course, um, the rise and popularity of algorithms as uh, quite huge uh, uh, social, cultural, and uh, political implications. So for instance, uh, Meredith uh, Broussard um, calls uh, uh, techno-chauvinism the blind um, optimism towards technology. So uh, what she says is uh, our collective enthusiasm uh, for applying computer technology to everything and algorithm to every aspect of life has resulted in a very bad design. So this produces what she calls artificial, this is I really like, artificial unintelligence, or what other people have called artificial stupidity, which is very interesting for me. Um, for uh, people like, for scholars like Sophia uh, Noble, Kate Crawford, and Ito Steyer, algorithms reproduce and amplify um, social norms, races, assumptions, and oppressing behaviors. And um, this with quite a deterministic um, cruelty. But the algorithms have also been appropriated and used by scientists and artists, and nobody's talking about them. Okay, somebody has talked about uh, the use of algorithms in art, but in a not, um, a uh, fun way, let's put it this way. So for example, um, somebody who, some of the people who uh, emailed me uh, mentioned uh, the Christie's sale, the infamous Christie's sale of uh, an algorithm, algorithmically generated uh, painting. Um, I think the work was by Obvious, it's a, a group of designers, I think. And that was very, like it was a source of a lot of debate. Uh, so this uh, prompted some responses from curators and uh, critics. And for example, curator Caroline Christoph Bakaryev um, responded by saying, artists who fetishize the medium, whatever that medium, they're just generally not good artists. A good artist, a real artist, will reflect on the implications of a technological revolution like AI and they'll use it to show certain implications on our subjectivity. Um, 
but there's also something else that I would like. This this is kind of interesting as a response, but also a little bit shallow. Uh, the other response that I uh, I okay, she's listening, uh, brother. <laughs> The other thing that I would like to uh, to mention is uh, uh, Ebru uh, Yetitsin, uh, a Turkish uh, scholar. Uh, she says it is imperative that as scholars, as human beings, and as artists and as scientists, we interrogate algorithmic um, governance. In fact, uh, algorithm operations can be reappropriated. We don't have to take them as a given. They can be reappropriated in subversive and resistant ways for alternate purposes. And this is where I think things become very interesting. Um, so the questions that I initially asked uh, uh, during tonight is what is the role and uses of programming and algorithms in artwork creation? And what is the role in SciArt, that is, in the uh, uh, join, joining and uh, collaboration between art and science. Are they um, are algorithms used as just a medium uh, to be well hidden by the audience uh, or by an audience just interested in the surface or the interface? Uh, or can algorithmic features be uh, both medium and content? Can they reveal the inner working, the politics, the strategic uses of code and algorithmic complexity in a culture increasingly withdrawn from their crucial implications? Can they provide new information uh, to uh, people, to activists or to uh, people who are interested in science? Can they inform, can they uh, uh, teach us something? And I think that um, by uh, looking at different perspectives of uh, um, programming and algorithm, algori algorithmic uses in SciArt, uh, tonight we will initiate, I'm not saying that we are concluding, but we initiate a discussion about the role of uh, um, algorithms and we will dispel all of these like prejudices about, about algorithmic art. Uh, so, um, sorry for my, Rant. I just needed to clarify something for myself and for other people. Uh, but uh, so, without further ado, let's start. And uh, so, the order will be so: Julia, Julia Krolik uh, will start, and then uh, this will be followed by Owen. No, then Sarah. Owen or Sarah, they will decide on the spot. <laughs> and they're gonna fight for it. And then Bernardo at the end. Okay, so Julia Krolik. I'm just going to undo this thing. Yeah. You can also talk. Oh, my God. I feel God. So I just hold this right up to my... So you, you put it very close. Oh, let's see. Well, can you guys hear me? I'm also, uh, you know, not super, not, not, not overly quiet. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, do you need the light on? Yeah, I think that would be great. If you don't mind, let me find my presentation. Here we go. Maybe more dark here and less dark there. Okay. Well, is that does that work for everybody? And you guys can hear me at the back. We're good. Okay. Um, so thank you so much, Roberta, for uh, partnering with Art of Science and. Uh, for all of you guys for, for being here and joining us, um, and for your rant. I, I think that <laughs> rant was awesome. Um, in, in my presentation, I don't think I'm going to get as heavy, <laughs> um, primarily because I really want to focus on, um, on the individual and I think the human side of this, really. For me, I'm interested in, 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 of course, the creative coding idea and what that means, but also the people behind that. So that's where I'm going with, with my presentation. Um, so I, when I was thinking about this, I was here previously talking about uh, a little more about my sire practice, which is rooted a lot in bioart and specifically clinical microbiology bioart. And I thought to myself, as someone that curates um, a blog for art to science, which I'll talk about later, that well, you know, I don't really, I haven't really seen a lot of coding and a lot of programming 
kind of, you know, come to the table and talks and, and, and I thought that we could do something that would be really fun as far as creative coding is concerned because I do have submissions that come to the blog with people that use, especially the people that use coding as a medium, if you will, to create work. Um, now, they don't program algorithms that then go ahead and create work. These are still people in somewhat of control and what they want out of their aesthetic, and I'll elaborate on that as well. Um, so I, uh, I saw Sarah speak uh, at Mutech, where Owen and I went, and she gave an amazing presentation, and I was really inspired by her talk. So I thought, oh, I would love to share the panel with her and talk, have her speak about her art, which she will do. And then I've been collaborating with Owen for almost 10 years now, and I'll talk about some of our projects. Um, and then when I was talking to Roberta, she said, you have to meet Bernardo. He's really awesome, and he's doing some incredible things with merging physics and, uh, and paint, and, and I'm, I'm interested. <laughs> so I thought this would be a really nice uh, panel to put together. So um, a little bit about me. Uh, of course, I mentioned already that I uh, engage in sire practice, um, and I do some work with Arthur Science, and I'll get into that. And then I also have um, a design studio. And so Owen and I are both a part of that, and it's called Pixels and Plans. And there I do data science and information design. And if you need to talk to me about that, there'll be plenty of time at the end, I'm sure. Um, so really, I wanted to talk about creative coding. It's a hashtag that I saw on Twitter kind of come up. And, and now, you know, I'd say 10 years ago wasn't there. Five years ago, maybe. And then in the last year, when I go hashtag creative coding, the feed is amazing. And so I really want to talk about coding in art and creative coding in art. So I'm going to talk about art and science first to give you an idea of that and how coding fits into that. Um, and then I want to talk about creative coding in the context of artwork production, and then also about creative coding in the context of producing experiences and what that means for the user. So art and science. Um, so art and science is a nonprofit organization. We started a couple of years ago. And uh, the main thing that we do is we facilitate artist residencies in science labs. And so what that means is we develop a program where we immersively take an artist and open up the wizard curtain of science for them. And we don't discriminate on any type of particular science. And I'll talk about a pilot that we did in March in a minute. Um, but the idea is to have that creative, that, that artists become a part of the research group in a very immersed way. So day one, they get all of the hazard and, and safety training that's required to be a part of the research group, because depending on what methodology is being used in the lab, they need to be versed in that so they can have a meaningful contribution and discussion amongst the group. And then after that, really, it's up to them and how they want to engage with the methodology and what they want to take from that and how they want to creatively disrupt that process. The second part uh, to what are the sciences is we have a gallery called the Polyfield Gallery. And so for the Polyfield Gallery, we do online exhibition. And some of the work that's created in the residencies ends up in the Polyfield Gallery. And then we also have a blog. And we've been running the blog for you know, pretty much as soon as Arthur Science started, so a few years now. And uh, that's a global initiative, so we get submissions from all over the world, and it's amazing to see what people um, bring to the table. And uh, we mainly have creators uh, where we have a set of interview questions, and we want to kind of just find out more about the kind of creative, you know, science artist is. And then we have works where perhaps you have a, a, an individual with an art practice that's not so much rooted in science, but they have a one-off work that is, and they want to feature that, so they'll submit that as a works. Uh, post in, in our category there. And then um, we have bits where we just kind of, you know, um, have fast information, if you will. We used to do spaces, but kind of ran out of SciArt spaces because there aren't that many. So um, we, we, we stopped that. And then we have some features. Uh, what's interesting about the blog and why I'm still going on about it is that because it is kind of this marriage of art and science, it was kind of validating for us to have um, we placed in, I think, top three in Canada's best online science. Uh, in 2017, which was that like pat on the back from the science community. And then with Feedspot that I guess classifies blogs, I think we're seventh in Canada and I don't know, like 70th or something, art, best art blog in the world, which I think is amazing because we got the science and the art kind of shout out. So that was really, that was really great. Um, so 
In terms of our residency, we put uh, a creative coder, Owen, and he's not going to talk about this in his presentation, but I'll talk about it here. Uh, we put him in an engineering lab, specifically an environmental engineering lab as part of Queen's Civil Engineering. And uh, Owen himself is an engineer, but in geophysics. So, so to him, he was completely out of his realm because even though he has some of that foundation, he has no idea how bioremediation works or what they're doing in this lab. The reason why we put somebody um, that has somewhat of a science, scientific background in this particular project is because we wanted to have Owen come at it and say, well, if this was somebody who lacked scientific training entirely, what are the pieces that they're really missing that we want to make sure we have in our next residency when we have a public call out and this is open to everyone. And we thought it would be really great to have somebody who can make those decisions and make those calls when they're on the ground in the residency because he called upon, oh, okay, I actually used my training here. I actually, because I knew this, this was easier. And if I did not know this, this would have been a lot harder. So make sure that, that you do. And the other thing that we did for this residency which was a two week immersive residency, is we set up a program evaluation. Because what's the point, in my opinion, of doing something without asking questions and evaluating it and you know, dis having discussion at the end. So this is, uh, we have actually a report online. If you go on artofscience.com under residencies, um, there's a, a full on report of the experience. We asked what value is it to the principal investigator to have this creative around for two weeks? Is it taxing? Are they bothering your grad students? Did you have some kind of amazing epiphany happen while they were there? What does this mean to you? And of course, at the same time, what does it mean for the creative to be amongst all of these you know, science students and, and participating in research meetings? And was that a valuable experience? Or is that something you want to forget entirely and never look back? Um, so I, but here I have some of the perspectives. We ended up doing some mind mapping and qualitative research is not my area of expertise. Uh, my area of expertise is quantitative research. The more data, the better. So uh, recently, I have uh, taken a step into <laughs> qualitative research, and it's amazing. But I, I, we have a program um, evaluation officer as part of our board, and she um, led this evaluation uh, along with a collaborator from Laurentian University whose whole um, practice and research is around evaluating. Um, these kind of initiatives. And so, but really ultimately the thing that came out is this, this kind of new perspective that the creative added to the lab, which is really interesting. I'm not going to go too deeply into the report. If you want to learn more about it, it's online, it's all there. And then we are, of course, moving into um, the phase two of this, and that is the interaction with the public. So now that we had this phase one of immersive residency experience, we are going to have two public events. Um, one will be this huge installation for science rendezvous um, where people will be able to walk through um, the artwork, which I'll get to in a minute, which relates to creative coding because it's a coded artwork. There is method to this madness. <laughs> um, but yeah, so, so, so we're also going to evaluate that as well. And we're going to do some um, survey-based evaluation and some observational evaluation to see, well, what, what is this for, 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 for the public to come and interact with, with the science artwork? What are they learning from it? In terms of the actual research that's done in the lab, um, Kevin Mumford's group does a lot of um, remediation work. And they work with this incredible column set up, which you see here. And so they trap a thin layer of sand between two layers of plexiglass, and then they look at different movements of different substances throughout that membrane. So Owen was really interested in the negative spaces, and so he's working on something that will be responsive as participants go through it. The sand in this kind of projected column is going to respond to folks as they go through. What we thought was really interesting is when we posted this kind of approximation that he made when he was still in his residency of sand versus code, people had this like, interesting reaction to, well, how do you model sand? Because it's not perfect, right? Um, anyway, if you want to learn about how he is doing that, you can talk to him about it. Um, so I want to dive into creative coding and artwork production, because here, really, you're using this as a medium. And I know your curator said that all of these artists must be terrible if they're, <laughs> just kidding. If they're using it as a medium. I beg to differ. Um, so I think that in that sense, if you are the programmer, you kind of really take on one of these two roles, at least in my experience. Either you're the artist, because you're the one that's programming, you're choosing to do something creative with that, or you collaborate. And so I'm going to start with 
creative coders as artists. So I'll just talk about a few that, that I've come across that I've had personal interactions with through the blog that I found fascinating. And I think they resonate with me because they both, this is, so this is Mark J. Stock, and um, he's an engineer actually in aerospace, but he also has an art practice. Um, he's kind of really secretive about what uh, specifically he programs in, so I can't tell you. Um, but I know everything he does is quite custom. Um, and so what, what I love is his exploration of digital and organic. And it's really fascinating when I look at some of the work that he creates because he's really after having that, that organic aesthetic, even though it's completely digitally rendered. And I think that that's really, really interesting. And so Giuseppe Rondazzo is another artist who is not as secretive about, so he, about his um, methods. He uses Java and uh, processing and also C++. Um, and uh, again, yeah, these are, these are actually programmed, but they have this organic component to them, and I'm just biased towards that aesthetic. I don't, maybe it's the, the, the microbiologist in me or whatever, but um, what I think also is interesting in this case is the, the medium in which they choose to then kind of interact with the public as far as their work is concerned, because both of them do 3D printing. Which I think is interesting. This idea of creating something really digital, but then putting it right back into this tangible medium of either printing it and selling prints of their art or making 3D sculptures of their art. So then going to the collaborator side, um, you can draw from some personal experiences in collaborating with Owen for so long. Um, I cultured the bacteria from Kingston a while back a long time ago, I borrowed the lab and I thought it would be fun to show people what all of the bacteria are that are around them in everyday spaces. And so initially I exhibited that as a photographic installation, but I thought that it could really benefit from just, you know, being a little bit more than that. So when Owen and I were chatting about it, I thought, well, what could we do to make that work more dynamic? And uh, so he developed an algorithm in um, conversation with me and how we think that the um, images could look and be presented so that they take on a different form. And so it's interesting because for me in this case, it's not so much that the, you know, the, the end result is, is the code, but it's really heavily embedded in that because it's helping me present the artwork. Um, we've done a number of different collaborations. Uh, this one's called Depth to Water. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about it, but in a nutshell, it's a project I worked on when I used to be a researcher for Public Health Ontario. I looked at uh, groundwater quality for people on private wells. Um, so what we ended up doing is running a, a SQL database of like over 300 and something thousand data points. But really, we just wanted to showcase that you could see the geography of Ontario by the holes that are in it, uh, which I think is fascinating. And then you can look at the depth as this um, scrolls down and hits that screen. We are mapping the depth at which they struck water and then it goes all the way down because they keep drilling past that point. Um, so without having a partner that can creatively code and talk to me and engage with me, this project would have a completely different you know, way of interacting. In fact, initially, all of this data is buried in a two gigabyte access database. <laughs> Who cares, right? Unless you go digging and bring it out, nobody really sees it. Um, we also partnered with Elaine, who's sitting right there, <laughs> who's an incredible bio artist. If you, um, if you have not heard of her, she's amazing. And um, so she created these incredible works and painted pathogens on masks. And we thought it would be really interesting to partner and present the work again in a dynamic form. So we ended up doing that, and we submitted it to the Toronto Urban Film Fest. And we won the Canadian Urbanism Award for the work. But what was really fascinating is just knowing that while it ran on the TTC subway screens, people were on the subway looking at <laughs> these masks and, 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 and these pathogens on them. So just having them kind of confront their, their, uh, their own um, you know, potential fears, I think, is, is really fantastic. And uh, yeah, so, so that's kind of some collaboration you know, ideas in, in terms of um, you know, where the, the code kind of really takes on that um, kind of that portal or that gateway or that gallery that it allows um, the artwork to transcend from one state to a whole other different state that oftentimes is time-based for these collaborations that I do. Um, so now I'm going to talk about 
um, using creative coding to produce experiences. And so really this is where the code is kind of the tool or the gallery. And I'm going to escape this for a second and actually show you some of these. So this is, uh, the first one I want to show you is Micah Scott's Zen Garden. I'm just going to pull this up. So this is a Zen photo garden. And what I love about this work is that um, I get to create my own art. And so this is what I mean by it's either a gallery or a tool, because in this case, this artist has created a way for us to be artists. And, you know, no, no, I, I, when I feature this on my blog, I had an incredible time because for me, anything that captures my attention on the internet for like half an hour or an hour is amazing. <laughs> and, and not only like something that I am passively ingesting, I am fully active and present trying to think if I can up my own game and how I can disrupt this particular, you know, work and what I can pull out of it. And so I, I, I really adore these kind of projects. Um, so the second one I wanted to talk about, and I'll just, I won't go back to the PowerPoint, I'll just go here, is uh, something called Silk. And so Silk is an interesting one because it, it allows you to, this is a bit skewed here, but basically you can just draw different patterns. And so what I wanted to do is I wanted to draw insects. So you have a little bit of, um, of an interface here that's provided. And um, you can pick the symmetry. So if I pick two-fold symmetry, I went in and kind of did something at the center, or you can um, have everything go toward the center or not, and you can pick different colors. And so again, another way that, that I got completely lost in trying to create my own different patterns. And I mean, the possibilities are so infinite in what you can do with this, but there's something about having that direct ownership over what I'm making through someone else's creative coding project. Um, and of course, at the time that I played with it, this wasn't even an app yet. This was kind of, this is version, I don't actually know what version it is, but it's, it's, it's improved so much since it first started. So it's amazing to kind of come back to this since I featured it on a blog a couple of years ago and see that, that it's still, um, it's still going. Um, another work, uh, this is uh, a work that Owen and I did um, for a project called uh, Great Art for Great Lakes. So in that project, they had eight communities that had an artist come in and host workshops for the community members to create small pieces that would then contribute to a bigger artwork. So for instance, in Thunder Bay, community members got together and presented designs for the artist to then quilt and put together into a, um, a sorry, smaller pieces that became a part of a larger quilt. And then, so our task really was to create a digital experience, I guess gallery in a way, that connected all of the individual contributions because these folks came out to the community you know, um, workshops and participated. We wanted a way to have them see themselves as part of this process and also of course see the bigger artwork. So here you can zoom in and you can see the artwork, but then, um, let me just zoom out. You can also look at all of the individual pieces that actually make up that in that bigger piece. And I mean, this is just D3 circle packing, but you know, we, we added a, a lazy load function to this because if someone is in a rural community, we don't want them to load all of this at once, right? So thinking about some of these things from the code side and really keeping that user experience in mind, I think is, is valuable, but this also changes the way that we're used to thinking about you know, way that we look at galleries online and the way that we, that we look at images. So of course, in this way, you can navigate um, all of the, the pieces that were participate, that, all of the, the pieces that were part of the bigger project. This was um, Toronto's um, installation at the Ontario Science Centre. It was the bathymetry of the Great Lakes um, as done through origami. There's a number of other ones. I'm not going to go through them all, but this is kind of this geographic idea. So again, just rethinking the traditional digital gallery, which is you know a slideshow or what have you, and, and applying something different to that. Um, and sometimes it can be really simple. Like this is this is uh, this is a, a Marcus Lyons work in the Polyfield Gallery. And I mean, I don't even know if I can go as far as saying creative coding, but I just want to kind of get you thinking about this idea. This tool here that is allowing us to zoom into his work 
Like you see shoes on Amazon this way, right? Like this isn't anything fancy. It's an e-commerce Zoom function <laughs> to look to look at your product closer before you buy it. But why not have it look at an artwork closer? You know, I mean, this is a huge tiled piece. Uh, it's like 5,000 pixels wide. This way you can really get right into it and look at the different um, pieces of the work. Um, another one that that I really like is um, is a work that um, was photographed by um, Levon Biss. So he is a photographer and decided to partner with, the, I think it's the Oxford Museum. I don't have my notes because I'm right in the browser here. But they have a collection of specimens. And again, you know, if you go to an archive and you look at different ways that people you know, decide to present their, their their collections. I think this is probably one of my favorites that I have experienced, but I love learning more if you have them. So he photographed these beetles, but what he allows you to do, again, using tiling, is to really, really get in to experiencing the collection. And it's just, it's just incredible, right? I feel like I'm using a microscope on the web. I got lost for like hours in this because he has so many different um, organisms. And this is just, this is growing since again, the last time I checked in, which didn't help as I was putting together this talk <laughs> because I saw he had butterflies now. Um, but I just think that's such an amazing way to present a collection of specimens online it's engaging and it's different and it allows you to kind of be at the at the wheel and how you experience this. So I'm just gonna move forward past the ones that I've shown you. So this was Yuri's work silk, and then I talked about community flow and up to genome and the microsculpture. So I wanted to just kind of talk a little bit about um, what art the science is doing next in the context of coding specifically and art. And then I don't want to speak any longer because I want to hear from our awesome speakers. Um, so one of the things that, that we are working on is setting up a data artist residency. And unlike the, um, the residency where we stick a creative <laughs> or artist into a lab and have them have to kind of you know interact and find their way and be a part of the research group. This is more of a longer term idea where maybe it could be done over a year. Um, but we want to encourage um, a, an artist that's interested in working with data to um, basically pick a data set or work with us to look at the many data sets that are available um, online and think of a way that maybe they want to get creatively involved. Um, and so a big part of this for us too is of course this idea of, of, of um, providing some digital literacy too to the artist that's interested in terms of data handling, data grooming, data management, what can they learn in terms of those skills if they are interested in pursuing and incorporating that as part of their artistic practice. So we're working on some uh, partnerships and uh, we'd like to launch that um, probably, I'm not sure about 2019, but definitely starting the pieces for that and probably gonna launch that in, in 2020. Um, and the other thing, of course, without the science is that in the Polyfield Gallery, we try to be as innovative as possible in the way that we create the user experience for the artworks that we do. So um, there's, there's opportunities there if people want to get involved or have ideas in terms of how we shape the gallery. Um, this is my contact information if you want to get in touch. Um, I think that it's also on our website. So I'm gonna end my talk there and queue up. Are you guys gonna rock paper scissors or not? Just kidding. <laughs> Who, hey, I think. <laughs> you know, if we actually had rock right. paper scissors, like, maybe that'd be an example of using an algorithm to curate our evening. <laughs> My power amulet. Yeah. All right. Um, so, hi everyone. Um, thank you, Julia, for getting us all together. Uh, my name is Sarah Friend. Uh, I'm an artist and software engineer. Um, professionally, I work in the blockchain or cryptocurrency space, um, but I also make a variety of art that we will talk about tonight. Um, the title of this talk is Software as a Medium. Um, so, first, we're going to talk a little bit about 
what that means. Um, we're going to look at some examples from my own work um, and then some from the broader art community. Um, so what is an art medium? It may seem like an obvious question, but I think it's useful to look at in detail. Um, painting is an art medium. Sculpture can be an art medium. Um, dance could be a medium. A medium, in this case, being the stuff that an artwork is made from. Um, it's a material, and any material contains properties. Um, it lends itself to certain aesthetics. It contains certain constraints, and you can treat these constraints and aesthetics like ready-made building blocks. Um, so if you think about a painter like Jackson Pollock dripping paint onto a canvas, he's using the properties of the paint itself, its viscosity, its surface tension, etc., to become these indivisible building blocks of the painting. Um, another painter from the same era, uh, Helen Frankenthaler, um, in the era's abstract expressionism in the US, um, and this is a painting that's fundamentally about painting itself, the types of mark making that paint enables. Um, an art world term popular at this time was formalism, and formalism is considering an artwork only for its form um, or, the, or the medium for its formal properties. Um, a question I ask myself a lot, um, and I don't necessarily have an answer for, is what would software formalism look like? Um, and I wouldn't say that I have a formalist practice, but I think that the idea of using the properties of software in this kind of inward, self-referential way um, informs my recent work. Um, so let's look at a few examples. Uh, this is from a new piece uh, called Perverse Affordances. Um, it was first exhibited about a month ago in Hong Kong. Um, and it includes a few elements, among other things, it uses a machine learning model to create new images of social media networks. Um, so if you're unfamiliar with generative machine learning, and if you are, in fact, a machine learning researcher, I apologize because you already know all of this. Um, the first step is usually to gather data, and then you train the model, um, and then you generate new images. Um, and for me, I didn't just want to generate images. I also wanted to do something with them. So there's this fourth step of creating interactivity. Um, now, you might look at this list and think that uh, training the model, doing the actual machine learning, is going to be the difficult part. But actually, it turned out to be gathering the data. Um, and part of why this is is just the sheer volume of data needed. Um, so the lower recommended bound for this type of machine learning is about, I hear, 10,000 images. Um, the way I ended up doing this was a browser automation framework called Selenium. Um, I wrote a program that would log in to all these websites and crawl through them randomly collecting screenshots. Um, and the ones that I scraped were Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, Pinterest, Reddit, Sina Weibo, YouTube, WeChat's browser UI, and Twitter. Um, and it uses a type of neural net called a GANS, or Generative Adversarial Network. Um, and the way these work is you have two neural nets, each with a different function. Um, so one is a generator, and one is a discriminator. Um, and they both start from zero, so having no knowledge um, of what you're trying to do. Um, the generator is fed noise, um, and the discriminator is fed examples from your data set. Um, and you might think that it's going to be, uh, so the generator generates an image, and then the discriminator has to decide which image is real um, and which is fake. Um, and you might think that this is going to be easy for the discriminator to do, considering it has access to your actual data set. Um, but the thing is that both of these neural nets are starting from an untrained state. Um, so they're both pretty bad at their task, and sometimes the generator will succeed early on, um, even though its images actually looks nothing like a social media screenshot. Um, and over time, many, many iterations of this, the feedback loop, tight loop tightens, and the images become better. Um, so this is the neural net implementation I use. I did not implement my own neural net um, in case anyone wants to try it. Um, and this is the first epoch, so the output after the first sort of large batch of the training process. Um, and you'll see they're pretty bad. They look a lot like noise still. Um, though I kind of love this image, it reminds me of the work of Agnes Martin, who is a painter from the late 60s, part of this sort of formalist, abstract expressionist era. Um, and this is in the final stages of training. So you get images that really do start to look like fake social media screenshots. You can see sort of header bars, modals. Um, one of the things that I think is really interesting is I guess there was just too much noise in the actual photos from these screenshots. So the, um, 
the model didn't really learn what to do with them except to kind of put textures in and cluster colors together, which ended up being quite beautiful. Um, and then to move on to the interactive component of the work, um, which I hope to deploy to the public internet soon, but for now you can only see when it's installed somewhere. Um, I kind of zoom in on a frame from this, and then I draw into it with HTML. Um, so this is sort of like making, to me it felt like making a formalist painting of a social media network. Um, and so I use these um, images kind of like UI wireframes or templates. This one becomes modals, um, et cetera. Look at a few more. And the text in these images uh, comes from a book called The Senses Considered as Perceptual Systems from 1966. Um, which is the first place that the word affordances was used. Um, and this particular chapter is about how humans perceive, how we remember images, and how we identify what we're looking at. Um, so there are about eight screens like this, and I may add more. Um, so the question you may find yourself asking after looking at this work is, why social media? Um, but to get to it, the question we're actually going to talk about is, what is seeing? Um, which for most of us is a biological process that goes on all the time without conscious thought. Um, and it's tightly coupled to perceiving, aka knowing what it is we're actually looking at. Um, and social media networks are seeing us all the time um, in the form of big data, analytics, um, the surveillance state, etc. All of which probably have machine learning algorithms running against them at all times. Um, but this isn't how we see and it's not how we think about seeing. Um, even when we have neural nets that train on and create images, um, as we watch them train, often the dominant impression is that these algorithms don't see the way we do at all. It's an impression of alienness. Um, so for example, just watching the first few frames of this, maybe the most striking thing is how far away they are from what you might get if you asked a human to draw a bad, fake social media screenshot. Um, and these differences become especially obvious when we look at adversarial images, um, which are images designed to fool machine learning algorithms. Um, so, for example, the two images of a panda that look almost identical to a person, but an image classifier would label one a panda and the other a gibbon, which is a type of bird. Um, this is another example. This is a sticker that when you put it on anything, reportedly, um, will make image classifiers think it's looking at a toaster. <laughs> so we, so, so as we, as we like dive into machine learning, we get this weird reversal where we get to see the act of seeing through, by looking through this kind of alien eye. Um, and when we have an opportunity to make alien things that are familiar and forgotten, like seeing, an interesting place to point that eye is at those things that are familiar and forgotten, but in fact alien. And I'm talking, by the way, about us on social media. Um, these interfaces are new to our species, and that's something that's faded into the background for most of us. Um, but the reality is that they were designed. Um, they're made to enable certain behaviors, um, incentivize certain actions, uh, friend count, like keeping score. Um, and we optimize from what we measure, but in that measuring, some things are always left out. Um, and one of the ironies of this piece, by the way, is um, though it's all about making things visible, it involved me effectively hiding. Um, and what I mean by that is that the process of creating this data set involved me randomly crawling social media networks, clicking um, far, far more random clicks than actual clicks, um, effectively creating noise. Um, hiding my actual behavior and actual likes, um, like a needle in a haystack, um, from the machine learning algorithms watching me. All right, so let's return to this theme and translate it um, to talk about some of my other work. If we have software as a medium, can we maybe have blockchains as a medium? This is what I do professionally. Um, so ClickMine is another project of mine. It's a clicker game. Um, and what that means is that it's only minimally interactive. Uh, so the player is limited to clicking to mine and purchasing various power-ups. Um, as the player does this clicking, a token or cryptocurrency on the Ethereum network is minted, and this virtual plot of land is destroyed. Um, so there are references being made here to click work, uh, click farms, and of course, the environmental consequences of proof-of-work mining. 
Um, this is a photo of a recent install here in Toronto. Um, and the token that is minted by this clicking, I'll mention, is in every way a real token, um, just like the ones you may have heard of sold at ICOs or traded on cryptocurrency exchanges. Um, this is my contract on Etherscan, um, which is like a Wikipedia or a viewer into the Ethereum network. Um, at the time of this screenshot, it had um, a little over 300 interactions. It now has um, more than 800. Um, and if you click on one of the token holders, um, you'll see the ClickMine token appear in their balances, and it will also appear in other wallets or UIs. Um, this game is, in a way, a satire of what is incentivized by the cryptocurrency industry um, with the ICO phenomenon. Unlike most cryptocurrencies, and certainly unlike most artworks, um, the token that is minted by the game is designed to be valueless. Um, so as I'm, as I'm creating it, uh, it's hyperinflationary. So it's getting created at a rate that is constantly increasing, leading to ridiculous quantities of it being in circulation. Um, and I do this, hopefully, to subvert the idea of a token as being something that has value. Um, and to do that, I also exploit certain bugs or assumptions um, about the way um, this blockchain works. Uh, so here are some examples. Um, this is a screenshot from the final, section, final um, moments of the game, um, and the land is completely destroyed. And the player has been clicking, um, and then they click again, and this happens. And I'll play that again, and look right here. Um, so you click, and suddenly you have fewer tokens than you did a moment ago. Um, this is a deliberate integer overflow. Um, so a number in the Ethereum virtual machine has only so many bits. Um, and once all those bits are taken, if you add one to it, it will overflow or become zero. Um, and if you keep playing the game after this point, your balance will just fluctuate wildly. Um, another is that I left out the total supply parameter on the contract, um, which will affect different UIs differently, but this is my favorite example. Um, when you go to look at who has this token, um, you'll see that the top token holders, despite having like 10 to the 76th power of this token, um, still have 0% of the total supply, implying that the total supply is infinite. Um, so yeah, these are ways to, that I'm trying to exploit structural things um, in this smart contract, this computer program, um, to add new layers of meaning. Um, so to give more context from another example, um, this, is, this is a screenshot from a text adventure game I made called You Are a Rock. Um, and to spoil it completely for you, it ends with a stack trace, um, which is an error output um, from a computer program. And this is real. I end the game by crashing the Python interpreter. Um, but this is one that has a special meaning. If you read this text, um, it's part of the plot of the game. Um, and also, while you're playing, the text color changes based on parts of speech. Um, and this is supposed to mimic the syntax highlighting that in text editor. So one of these screenshots is the game, and one is a text editor. Uh, so again, not only using the, um, trying to use the aesthetics of software um, and writing software itself uh, as part of the game, and the game is, fun fact, about learning to write software. Um, so hopefully that gives some context from my practice um, and the kind of things I think about. Um, but I do have some examples of other artists working in this terrain as well who are kind of using algorithms, blockchains, and software as core elements to what they're doing. Um, so the first example is an artist named Rob Myers who's done a ton of work in the blockchain space and otherwise. Um, but this is one of my favorite pieces. It's a switch, basically. Um, that says whether or not the contract is art. Um, so the gallery goer, or indeed anyone in the world, uh, can change that designation at any time. Um, the piece is playful. Um, it kind of references this Cecinus pa un peep um, theme. Um, also the binary bit that is a one or zero, the digital signal that is on or off. Um, and it's asking whether a piece of code that lives on a peer-to-peer -peer network like a blockchain can itself be an artwork. Um, a project called Autonomous by my colleague Simon de la Riviere uh, is investigating whether an artwork can own itself or whether you can have an autonomous art object. 
Um, so this is a set of smart contracts that automates the creation and sale of generative art pieces. Um, and it also pays humans to write new generators. Um, so there are a few different economic models being worked on and now by a community of programmers, it's all open source. Um, but basically this is creating a marketplace for the writing of generators and crowdsourcing that curation. Um, so you have two layers of algorithms at play here. Um, you have the image generators and then you have the curation contracts and you can, you can look at a work like this and ask yourself, you know, who really is the artist? Um, I think there's an echo here to some of the works Julia talked about where, you know, you have this tool and then you have the person who uses the tool and, you know, both of these things could be artworks. Um, I see um, Artonomous is being in dialogue with something like Archelect, um, which is a bot made by someone who I can only find identified as PAC. Um, Archelect posts images on social media, net on social media networks, um, collects data about which posts the audience likes, um, and uses that data to learn um, to curate better posts. Um, so you could say that this is autonomous, you could say that it's crowdsourced, um, and again, you have these two layers at play, the images themselves, which are artworks, and the algorithm that is choosing them. Um, moving back into interfaces, an artist named Ben Grosser um, has two relevant projects here. Um, one, they're both uh, Chrome extensions, I believe. One is called Textbook, and it removes all of the images from Facebook. Um, and one is called <laughs> Safebook, which removes all of the content. Um, so if you're going to think about user interfaces as a medium, and especially like formalist user, user interfaces, um, I think these are both great examples. Um, and uh, Olia Lialina, um, one of my favorite artists, um, has this piece called Once Upon. And so she's recreated Facebook, YouTube, and Google Plus with the technology of 1997. Um, so her website uh, for the piece says, best viewed with Netscape Navigator 4.3, a screen resolution of 1024 by 768 running on Windows 95. Um, so this is an exploration not only of interfaces, but the way that our assumptions about and ability to interact with them have changed. Um, and finally, I want to give a shout out to Cluster Duck, um, who are an artist collective from the deep internet. Um, and one of their members is the creator of the adversarial patch I showed you earlier, and you can buy it from their web store. Turn everything into a toaster. Thank you, everyone. Um, my name's Sarah. Oh. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. Yeah, that was really great. Uh, a lot of use of very uh, cutting edge uh, themes in the. Uh, oh, yes, thank you. And also, I, I noticed this is still happening. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Now I have one small problem, and that is that I'm looking at my talk here, but you guys are still looking at this meme. Um, you know, sometimes um, they did it on purpose. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> are you mirroring the displays, or are you not? I'll have to go into. Uh, the tab to go around because sometimes it gets. <laughs> oh, I see. Yeah, something's happening. If you use the tab, so if you go like um, um, Apple tab and I'm going to try then to. You have to quit and then you can go back to the other one. Oh, you think so? <laughs> oh, you now you have a uh, yeah. So, what if you do this? So now there's. I just want to run. Come on. So quit. Uh, um, 
quit PowerPoint. The, the, the problem is PowerPoint. <laughs> there you go. Now I need to find my presentation. Can I full screen that? Yes, we can. Almost full screen. There's a flag in Google Chrome that will make it full screen. This has been, uh, thanks for your patience, by the way, while I figure out the Macintosh operating system. Um, <laughs> it's all about mirroring displays. Uh, the irony is I actually work in the Apple, uh, the Macintosh operating system. <laughs> so the, this, this uh, Google Chrome actually, and variety of web browsers, uh, there's always this little thing about full screen because we, we are always aiming for full screen. I do most of my development in the web browser and you want to have a nice kiosk. Uh, so this you, you, can, you can make do with, with the browser. I'll have to change the flag. Um, so my name is Owen Fernley, uh, and the title of my talk is Audio Visual Algorithms. And uh, so uh, I was go over my my background. Uh, so I have I have two two worlds that I've been uh, inter interweaving for the past few years. Uh, on the one side, uh, I have for a long time been a research geophysicist. And then on the other side, uh, as I might want to say, a digital media artist. Um, so, in uh, so first, I just want to just touch on geophysics. Uh, I worked for a long time under uh, someone by the name of Yves Lamontagne, who graduated from this very university in the late 70s under Gordon West out of the geological department, and he is uh, is a phys physics. Thank you. Yeah, both. Well, Geological physics, yeah. <laughs> um, so I, I spent a long time working under him. Uh, this is uh, his equipment here. It's the UTEM system, and it uh, measures uh, electromagnetic uh, waveforms from a large loop that energizes under the ground. And the time it takes for uh, a potential ore body to decay can be used to determine what shape and where the ore body lies. So this would be a, a field survey in Australia. And uh, this is me demonstrating bad data collection because the wind is slowly moving this coil very, very subtly such that the data will become uselessly noisy. But uh, when I arrived, uh, I was also simultaneously hired to do software. And uh, at the time, uh, they were making the best from their 1990s uh, software, uh, 3D viewing software. So this is kind of using uh, OpenGL, and that's uh, the, the Mac OS 9 uh, uh, title bar above. So kind of this would fit well with that talk, with that project from the 90s. And this would be their geophysics uh, plotting software. And uh, pretty much the, uh, the, uh, co the contribution that I made to uh, during the time working was to bring the software up to, uh, to into the web. So this is a D3 version of the plotter that runs in, uh, in, in web browsers, and you can drag and drop your data and it would plot. And then taking this uh, and bring it into uh, 3JS uh, and WebGL, you can do uh, a, modern, uh, a modern version of, of the software. All, all through the, all through the web, which was extremely fascinating to me and to and to Eve, and uh, and it was kind of interesting to start uh, on these these projects at around uh, 2010 2009, and roll forward with all this uh, with with the ideas of bringing in scientific programming and connecting up uh, ways of calculating uh, physics and putting it into uh, something like a web browser. Um, which proved to me that uh, web browser technology has become uh, ex extremely versatile and, and powerful. Um, I should say that this would be the viewer, but then to actually make these calculations of the electromagnetic field with the, uh, with the, the mesh, uh, that requires an engine. So there's also a lot of server connections uh, as, you, as you make the browser uh, pull the, um, the engine. So that was, that was uh, basically a lot of simultaneous training in, 
encoding through the browser. But at the same time, I was doing a lot of uh, digital media. So um, around the same time that I began doing the web browsing uh, or the uh, development, uh, I was also uh, working on a project called Decomposing Pianos uh, with Julia at the time many years ago. And it was an experimental music uh, uh, duo or collaboration. So um, actually, before I get, I'm just going to quickly hop to that website. So here, the very beginnings of my understanding of what uh, I would want to do with, with JavaScript started by just wanting to be able to play a song. And here, you have a little stop play button, and then you can connect that to a counter, and then you could begin. And then from there, I was like, well, I'm doing a lot of the scientific programming, but this uh, web stuff, like, it's very good for posting and getting this stuff going. And uh, what, what can happen from this, right? So, so moving, uh, moving forward in this, um, we did a project called 88 Years, which was uh, not really a, was not supposed to be a coding project, uh, but it ended up being the biggest coding project in the world. It taught me most of the stuff that I wanted to know about web browsers and ported into geophysics as well. Um, and that's uh, basically we went through and we sonified the age of uh, of 88 people onto a piano keyboard, so that if you were to play a chord, you would hear the relative ages of people in that room or pe or groups of people. So uh, at the height of the keyboard is uh, is a one-year-old or less than one-year-old, and then an 88-year-old. Um, so we did the uh, we did the project, um, but we had kind of a big question as to how to put this out there to share, um, because because like you have one chord, you have like these people, but really you want it to be have an interactive component. So then you're thinking, well. Could you do uh, a drop-down menu? Like I can do drop-down menus, and then I or I or could I like uh, like sort of collect? How could I do this? And it's like, well, really, it's the piano. You want to be able to just play it. So we uh, so from there, uh, I began to do a bit of goal-oriented learning and and figure out how to actually present it. So that would be that would be how that that was done. And I think I'm just because I'm here, I could probably just try it. So it's this. This is uh, this is an oldie and a goodie. We'll see the internet connection. Yeah. So and then you can just leave it, and then that's the that's the sound of those individuals that I played. So it's fun. Um, It doesn't always make sense in terms of, like, you know, if you tell a computer algorithm to just do something random, that's kind of what you get. So, so you do have to think about ways of making uh, ways of making the algorithm work for you. Um, after that uh, little experiment, uh, we got into doing more of th these kinds of collaborations, and uh, this is uh, a piece called uh, Intersection. And uh, it uh, is uh, uh, aerial views from a data set that Julia was working on at the time. And we used the same, we called this the glitch code. Uh, it was used also in Elaine's video that you saw earlier. And it's not particularly complicated. It's basically a opacity slideshow. But what's interesting is I had this nice slideshow working, and then I narrowed down the timing to uh, as short as possible, such that before the opacity switched, it would already change the image, and the, and you had this sort of surreal, glitchy effect. And at the time, I didn't even know how it happened, and then I had to study backwards to find out. Oh, that's how it. So it was. So it made it for an interesting uh, a way of presenting. But what's neat about this is it's just one area, and we use Photoshop and we sliced around the frames, and. That way, you get these random connections. And I mean, it could happen right now, but you might get all three lining up. And sometimes you will see two line up. But out of the bucket of images, it will randomly slice things together. But what we found really aesthetic about this is the fact that because this is all one area, and it's all designed in sort of a similar time frame, you get a lot of uh, sort of 
coincidental lining up of a variety of uh, pathways and roads and, and, uh, and urban design. So it's almost like it, it connects together. But again, this whole project was uh, driven by, by the, this sort of uh, glitch code as, as a tool to, pr to present this. Um, another, so, so you, you discover yourself going down this little rabbit hole uh, of, of coming up with algorithms to support ideas. Uh, and this uh, is another project I collaborated with my, my friend Christopher Trimmer, who had a show called Cognitive Dissonance. And he was really inspired by this uh, Glenn Gould idea of mixing in different, like if you sit in a cafe and you hear conversation from over here and conversation over there, and you mix it together. And he was really fascinated with that concept. And he would sit for, you know, and, and mix things together on, on faders. And we started talking about how it would be interesting to, uh, to do it in a different way of, of mixing. Um, I'm just going to launch the terminal, hopefully. I'll get my feet wet on that. It's actually, it's already running. Isn't that exciting for us? Um, so I think I've got this running on a server somewhere. Yeah. So it's funny, after watching uh, how you played Minecraft, I was thinking about making the controls Minecraft based, but I have to just remember how to drive around here. So this is what we what we ended up creating. Each week we explore an individual's very unique connection to music. Okay. We collect those and interviews, these conversations with self and musicians. We create this new individual and enjoy it. All programming and visuals were done by Owen So, and a thanks to everyone who did it. So, I don't know if you can hear the stereo field, but the, the sound is emanating from here in this tower. And then as you move around, uh, of course, you're using sort of sound video game design to, to keep track of it. Uh, so this was part of a, of a 20 minute piece that was at, the, uh, at a local movie theater. And uh, what we did is we brought in uh, people's voices from, from far away. And when they come in, you can start making your own mix by walking around uh, and visually mixing them. So I have to remind myself that it takes a full minute for them to come in because this is part of a 20 minute piece. But here they are now. So each of these spheres is somebody speaking and then the larger disc around the sphere is the, is the influence. So if you're standing inside, you'll hear the voice. And if you're standing outside, the voice will disappear. So they'll start talking now, and you'll hear you'll hear them them start to speak. So that one's that one's quiet right now, but that one there is speaking. I'm just backing up for a second. So if you back up, you're now outside of the influence of the entire thing. Right here, that's the outer boundary of the, uh, of the audio. So after that, you can't hear anything anymore. So that was a lot of fun. And, uh, and I think that pretty much shows that point for now. Um, so one thing that was really fun about this is the floor as well. You could put a low pass filter on. So when you go below the floor, it's like you're going underwater. But it was, uh, and then you start playing with these discs and you start stepping in and out. But as a result, I gave my friend a tool to be able to mix a recording uh, uh, exactly the way he wanted it to be mixed. Um, from there, we got into, uh, once you're getting into these visual things, it's hard not to get into projection uh, and projection software. So uh, we were, uh, Julia and I were uh, pr uh, put into a music festival where we could project onto the back of this wall. Uh, they asked if we wanted a screen, but 
we really wanted to use the wall itself. So we we made a projection software to be able to uh, to to map these out, and that was the the final map. And that was a really interesting performance piece that that we did using projection software. So the next year, there's a second room in the same building, and this room has a whole bunch of really small vertical pieces of wood. And when you put these together, this was uh, the projection challenge, just to put an FFT spectrum onto these uh, these little vertical lines. So this was the map, and uh, each of these lines are when you by the time you project it, I think it was about eight pixels wide per per line. But then what you could do is you can do the low frequency over here and the high frequency over there. And uh, I don't know if I have a, a yeah, well, that's that's a still of it. But basically, all of these things were moving up and down across the wood panels, which was which was a real blast. Um, and then we took that projection software and have have toured around with it. Uh, so web browser based projection software leads a lot of it's uh, it's it's a very good medium to to experiment with. So in October, uh, we were we were placed in another. Uh, performance, and this was an opportunity to investigate some new algorithms. So I'm just going to step through two interesting algorithms that just came from this show last month, and uh, they're just fresh. So I thought that I, I would uh, I would I would talk about them. So the first one is a standard waveform. Um, when you get into web audio through uh, browsers, you go on the MDM, and it's uh, the, the tutorial is right there for how to build uh, how to, how to build a waveform. So it, it just steps you through it. You can see it there. It's the same as the FFT. If you if you do this with Web Audio and Canvas, it's it's uh, it's it's available to to build. So we took a waveform uh, and we turned it on its head. And you can't. I mean, we did, maybe we should improve our documentation. But that's Matt right there, and this is a waveform kind of coming right out of his head as he's uh, as he's breathing as part of one of his pieces. And then the idea was to take the waveform and then wrap it around itself and make it into a make it into a disk. So uh, the thing about this waveform, that's the finalized version. But I do want to talk about sort of the journey, the the like while while building this of something that I ran into. So the concept here is you have the waveform coming in, and over here you want to take this and you want to wrap it around and connect it to here. So when you do that, you'll see that it's easy, easy enough in terms of uh, getting the circle and, 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 uh, and doing it off of the base. But this is a really unfortunate event happening right here. That's a, that's a seam uh, from, when, uh, from, from when the waveforms aren't lining up. So we couldn't really do the performance like that. So I mean, and I was under a lot of time pressure. And it was like, oh, well, great, here we go. There's a big seam issue. So uh, thinking about it, what I had to do was backtrack from the seam to the nearest null, uh, where the waveform crosses the, the zero mark. And when you find that null, that way you guarantee that they're going to connect at the other side. But the issue with that is when you backtrack, the circle uh, doesn't connect, right? So taking the actual individual, taking the actual waveforms out of it, that's what you get when you backtrack to the nearest null. So this one in particular had a really big uh, waveform, so that's missing almost half. So the next thing you need to do is you need to shrink the radius so that you can connect it. So I left the, the seam markers here. So that's a seam here. These are seams here. And it's probably, yeah, that's the seam there. So by shrinking just at the very mo moment that it occurs, you can then uh, connect it. And what's interesting about this was that you now made in software something that's very physical, because it's actually taking the the frequency going around the radius and and expanding or or uh, subtracting the uh, the circle to be able to to actually match the, the 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 frequency of the sound that it's making. So from the, from doing that, I mean, I could just imagine this in a physical world. It would be really, really fantastic and, and resonation. So, so that was that was just one step through of that particular waveform algorithm, which ended up being one of the pieces. The second little 
uh, fun time with was uh, with particles. Now there's a lot of stuff about particles. You can find all kinds of uh, very in intriguing tutorials about how to do particles. You can do flocking and you can do uh, tracking and and all kinds of ways that particles can interact. It's it's uh, it's it's very fascinating doing particles. And in fact, what Julia alluded with uh, the artist residency with uh, between the sand. I mean, that's a particle experiment right there. Instead of seeing these random colored dots, you actually have the sand. And then the uh, in investigation I'm looking at is actually what happens in between randomly associated particles. Um, so for for some of these particles, I was doing some experiments with uh, with drawing into in between with lines in between uh, experiments with circles. This is ni neither here nor there for art. It's kind of just like just what I ended up seeing. Uh, and then you can make everything work together and make make it go to a center point, which was so. I'm kind of just I'm stepping you through like a like a typical how how do you come up with a new algorithm? So then you're like, well, like you know that's that's a nice texture, but it's messy. That's also a nice texture, but the circle didn't work there. But centering it, that's now that's more powerful. Okay, sure. What can we do with that? So I animated the particles flowing into the center and falling into the center, which was uh, you know that just it seemed to be the next logical step after making such an obvious pathway, but the question was well what do you do once the particles get to the center you respawn them out at the other sides or what should what should happen so uh, I I was really interested in in geometry uh, it's uh, in terms of just shapes um, triangle square hexagon sept septagon and octagon and Here's an octagon, and this one's interesting. It's slightly, I believe it's slightly off center, but what I did was when it falls through, you can respawn it at the corner and build build a build an octagon that's falling. And then rather than having it fall straight in, you can kind of put a, a small rotation on it as it's falling so that it spirals in. It makes it a lot more interesting. So this is how we got to this uh, this big sort of lotus flower of the, that was uh, part of the performance. So as they fall in, they respawn here, and then they fall back into the center, and then they respawn again at the corners. And, uh, and then you remove the actual particles and just focus on the lines. And you have the, I just pressed the wrong button. And then you have the, the actual lotus, or the, what is we just called, I have no idea if it's a lotus, but I was very excited about it. So here's a, here's a couple couple of videos of, of what it looked like as the particles keep falling in. These are the edges of the particles, and you get the sort of slow rotation. Um, and then if you do it for other shapes, here's a square. And this is, did I go the, yeah. That's funny. I think that's the octagon again. And uh, I did a uh, 13 sided as well as, uh, as as triangles, but it was it was a lot of fun just to come up with that. So that concludes uh, my journey of algorithms, and uh, it was it was a lot of fun. And I appreciate your time and listening to what I had to say today. Thanks. Yeah, I'm not off the hook yet. I need to. I need to uh, to get Bernardo. Um, and show. And show. Oh, where? Not here. Yeah, like in the top there. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, like that, right there. The, yeah. <laughs> Okay, and that too. Close that. Yeah, close that too. How do you like doing it backwards? Upside down. This is a trip. I can open that. Did it work? There you go. I hereby present you with this for the relay race. Good luck. <laughs> Thank you. You've been invited. It's an honor. Okay. <laughs> okay. So that worked. Hello, everybody. I am Bernardo Palacios. I am from 
Universidad Nacional Autónoma de México, in particular from the Instituto de Investigaciones en Materiales, which translates to the Materials Research Institute. Okay, and I'm going to be talking about modern painting, but from a fluid mechanics perspective. I have done this work in collaboration with Dr. Roberto Zenit and Master in Arts Sandra Cetina. I would like to also thank undergraduate students Alfonso Rosario and Isaac Farias. Um, I don't see the clicker. Okay. No, that's not. Okay, doesn't matter. Okay, so this is UNAM or Universidad Nacional Autónoma de México. It is the biggest university that's Spanish spoken with a little less than 350,000 students, uh, over 40,000 teachers, 28 faculties in school, 58 research centers, and a little less than 3 million square kilometers of construction. And it even has a natural reserve within its campus. So that's UNAM. And I, in particular, work with Dr. Roberto Zenit's research groups. And what the group does goes from bubbly flows to the design of hard bulbs. Uh, we also do vortex dynamics and granular flows and even the swimming of microorganisms. What I do in particular is study painting. So what is painting? Well, painting is art. For example, here we have a painting by Siqueiros, who is a famous Mexican muralist. Uh, this is the biggest mural in the world. It's, it's a complete building. It's big, <laughs> okay? And how was this created? Well, this was created this way, right? Just done a ton of times, okay? And at the same time, what I just showed you is also a coating flow studied from the fluid mechanics perspective. And this has been extensively studied, studied mainly because it has a lot, a lot of practical importance and application on, on industry, right? So here is a bunch of papers of people who have worked on this problem. And well, what can I say about this is that painting is fluid mechanics. Painting is fluid mechanical. In this particular example, you can relate the width of this trace and the length of this trace and maybe the thickness, which is T, of this trace and relate that to the brush, to the volume of paint you used, to the speed you used to move the brush, and at the end to the viscosity, surface tension, and just the general fluid properties. So today I'm gonna be talking about three particular painting techniques. The first one is Jackson Pollock stripping technique. Then I'm gonna be talking about something we call flying catenaries. And I will finish with a particular technique called the calcomania. I'm gonna go into detail. So first, Jackson Pollock. I actually like the fact that Sarah also used Jackson Pollock as an example, and I was like, oh, she stole my painting. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So anyway, <laughs> this is, yeah, it's the, it's the exact same. <laughs> Anyway, so this is dripping technique used by Jackson Pollock between more or less 1948, 1951, and that's what he's mostly famous for. He had some previous work, but it's not really good, at least in my opinion, and it's not famous. So, well, we wanted to study the, the cool part. So, something rare is, rare, I mean, is to have video footage of Jackson Pollock while he's painting. In particular, this was filmed by Hans Namuth, and as you can see, it's 1951, so this is actually the decline of Jackson Pollock. He believes his, stole, his soul was stolen out of this film. Uh, he wasn't happy about it. So anyway, here we have Jackson Pollock. You can see the, the canvas is on the floor, so that's new. And we can see him with a broad range of movement and using different tools to power that paint into the canvas. Uh, if you hear the audio of the of the video, which is is the is is it's fine in YouTube, you can also hear that he would use thinner to control the properties of his paint. Okay, so we learned something about this video. We actually took data from this video and we measured, for example, the speed of Jackson Pollock's hand while he was painting, and also we took measurements of the height he was using, more or less. Okay. Um, for example, in this plot, we can see the middle thick line, that's the mean height he would be using, and the other two lines are just standard deviations away from that, from that mean. Okay, so this is just to give us an idea of 
how Jackson Pollock was painting. So the next thing we did is experiment. So we created a machine that could create Jackson Pollock kind of traces. Uh, what we have here is Jackson Pollock's hand, which is moving with certain speed uh, from certain height, which is H, and with certain flow rate, which is Q, right? And we created a machine that does exactly the same thing. We have a syringe pump, so this is basically just a syringe filled with paint, and you know we were squeezing that syringe and making a flow of paint with certain control viscosity, and we also have control of the height and the speed of the substrate. We're not moving the syringe. We're moving the substrate. In this case, it's paper. So we're moving paper on the rest range. I'm going to show you a video. Okay? So this is what we got. This is a uh, result. Uh, in here, we are moving the paper slowly. And we have a really great height. And we can see these loops forming. OK, so what happens if we move just a little faster? Well, we still have the loops. But this time, the space in between those loops is it's greater. For example, here, we have loops that are so tightly packed that it, they seem like a really thick, straight line. And as we move faster, these loops start um, separating every time more. What happens if we keep moving just faster? Well, then we can cancel completely those loops forming. And of course, the result is just a straight line. Well, unfortunately, this had been previously studied. This is a movie by Rivian and collaborators. And that's the paper they, they have. And this is an experiment you can do yourselves at home if you take some honey and just power it over uh, more honey or over a toast. Uh, <laughs> you, can see, you can see that, that the honey will coil around itself, and it will form this block of honey and, and the coil at, at the top of it. So Professor Morris, who's here, by the way, um, had this experimental setup, and they would do something really similar to what we did, but they have a timing belt instead of paper, and this timing belt is continuously and being cleaned, so they don't keep the, the actual painting. As, uh, that's, that would be the main difference. And of course, he's using just silicon oil in this case. And we can see a really similar structure to what I just showed you with the loops. There's a ton of patterns you can form with this setup. So we took their theory and created a transition condition that's on the upper right corner. Uh, but well, that's mostly mad. And what that mad means is this line right here, the blue line. Okay. So we took our data and fitted a transition condition to learn where we would see that this transition, transition from coiling to, to straight lines, basically. And the other thing, the boxes and the little dot at the upper right corner of the plot is Jackson Pollock. And those are the measurements we took from him. OK, so if you take the mean uh, speed, flow rate, and height, that would be the dot. And the boxes are just basically standard deviations and playing a little bit with uh, the paint viscosity. So basically, what we can see from this plot is that Jackson Pollock is above the transition. Therefore, his paintings must be mostly straight lines. And this is true. We can see from his painting that he has no uh, loops on them, except for some details. For example, this is a particular picture I took myself and from a Pollock painting. And I went deep into it, and I did find these, these loops at some, at some of the details of the paintings. So what did we learn? Well, we found different patterns through experimentation. And we learned that Pollock controlled his painting in order to avoid a hydrodynamical instability, in this case, the, the coiling instability. And, well, and we also use this as an inspiration to maybe think about the non-Newtonian effects, which means that the paint, I mean, the paint is actually a really complex fluid. It's not just a Newtonian fluid. So we would like to experiment a little bit more on that field. And also about uh, dynamic range, because Pollock would accelerate a lot. He, he wasn't using just a constant speed. So this is just a source of inspiration to, to what we learned from this. So moving on. Now, here we have another painting. This painting is by Oscar Dominguez, who is a surrealist artist. And well, this is a surrealist paint. But what we are really interested on is these details. 
Okay, so we can see these details with our fine um, stri-like figures, and these are not made with with brushes, right? These are too detailed and just too complex. So how were these made? Well, let me do a demonstration as Oscar Dominguez says he, he used to do that. So you take some paint, you put it over some paper, then you put more paper over it. You would squeeze that paper, you peel it off, and there you go. That's really similar to what Oscar Dominguez has in his and his painting. So, okay, it works. So what do we do then? Well, we are physicists. We experiment again, right? So what we have is two plates with certain separation, with which is that letter B, and we will put certain volume of paint in between those plates, and we're gonna record all of that with a camera from the bottom. These are glass plates. Okay, so we're gonna separate those plates with certain speed. Everything is controlled, that's what we like here. <laughs> and this is a typical experiment. As you can see it from underneath those glass plates. Okay, and well, let's see a little detail. Okay, so here, time zero, we have a perfect circle. And as time goes by, we can see these finger-like structures forming towards the center of the circle. Some will stay, some will not grow, for example, here, and some will grow all the way to the center, right? This is really well known, it, it's, no, it's known as the Safman Taylor instability. Again, tons of work about it, so cool. We can actually try to understand how these paintings were done. For example, if I take the work by Nasi and her collaborators, uh, we can understand how the number of fingers uh, grows. I mean, how many fingers will we create with certain parameters, right? And what we learned as, is that this is mostly relying on two parameters. Uh, the dimensionless surface tension, which is the second line, and that depends on the capillary number and the aspect ratio. So that's basically the, cap the capillary number is comparing viscosity and surface tension. What's more important? And the aspect ratio is the radius of the original circle divided by the distance in between plates when we were starting this experiment. Uh, so basically, that's how much were you squeezing that. So let us see some results. First, low viscosity paint, high viscosity paint. Okay, so it works so far. With a greater viscosity, we have a greater capillary number, and therefore, as our theory said, we will have more fingers. So that's working. And then, squeeze a little, squeeze a lot on the right. Wow, now, that's a striking difference. And that's what we expected because uh, this particular parameter has uh, power to the third, okay? So everything's working quite well. And again, what did we learn? Well, we found different patterns and we discovered uh, the parameters you need to create these patterns. And what we learned is contrary to Pollock, the artists using the calcomania make use of an instability instead of avoiding it. For example, here we have, I want to talk about this paint because it's made by uh, Remedios Baro, who is a Mexican Spanish painter. And just to understand how this paint was made is you can see a perfect line in the middle and the cat is pretty symmetric, right? So I guess that what she did was make a stain of paint and then fold the paper and then just fold it back again, and she created those, those finger patterns, uh, which are quite symmetric. Again, we would like to know what the non-Newtonian effects are. We haven't done that so far. And also, in some experiments, we noticed that the patterns will disappear. Like, you create them, and then you, you will see the pattern just grow back into a perfect circle. So what, what's, what's making that? Why, why did the artist, why does the artist still have the pattern in his painting? And we wanna see if that's, well, what's the physics on that? And we, we suspect it could be uh, contact angles, which is related to the surface tension, or maybe the drying time of the paints. You need quick drying paints. So that, those are two ideas we, which we would like to explore. Finally, and to finish this talk, 
I would like to talk about flying catenary. So I go back to Pollock. This painting is called Mural. It's gigantic, as you can see, it's six meters by two and a half meters. So really, really big. It was painted in 1943. It was commissioned by Peggy Guggenheim, and it was the first important commission Pollock got. If we look close in detail, we will find these traces. So again, these are not done with brushes, contrary to the rest of the painting, which is mostly done, mostly done with brushes. And this is a photograph of Pollock and his studio. It was a tiny studio, so we know that he could not place the canvas horizontally. So it wasn't a dripping done detail. And also it's 1943, so he definitely was not dripping paint by, by then. So how did he do this? Well, again, we have a lab. We should make a robot. <laughs> So we got this robot, which is a mechanical arm, which is forming what we call a viscous catenary. And this viscous catenary will fly to a canvas and hit it. Let's see in detail. This is 400 frames per second, and we're reproducing this video more or less to 30. <laughs> so we can actually see some of the meandering, but happening on a, on a vertical canvas. I want to talk about that. Don't, don't. Come on, Stephen. <laughs> okay, so we have straight and curly lines formed in this experiment. So what is the secret? Thank you, Stephen. Well, first you need high centrifugal acceleration, right? Why? Because you need to form and expel a catenary. Basically means move that hand fast, okay? So we have not enough centrifugal acceleration, more than enough. So this is bad, that's good. And then, more interesting to Stephen, we need a high honest search number. This is a parameter used in fluid mechanics to, uh, to study jets or just these thin bodies of liquid. And we basically need to avoid the appearance of Riley plateau instabilities. Let me show you what that is. And we need a high on a certain number, so basically that means use a very high viscosity paint. Exactly what Stephen said. This will break into drops because it's not viscous enough. That will not, and that's what you need. So what did we learn? Again, we made an experimental reproduction which worked pretty well to understanding how these patterns were created. And we understood the parameters needed. High on a search number, high centrifugal acceleration, and you could add a little high Reynolds number to that because you could create some turbulence with that high Reynolds number and make it more wobbly like that, like the pink traces. And new to the fluid mechanics, we would like to create more stable catenaries and then break them into less stable and, and know how that actually works. And again, it's always interesting, the non-Newtonian effects. We are the rheology lab, which basically studies non-Newtonian effects. And this is just the introduction to, to making more research. And now just as general conclusions. Well, fluid mechanics can indeed understand some aspects of modern painting. And what I really like is that artists are sort of empirical physicists. They are learning how to control flow and manipulate the properties of paintings to maybe make some fluid mechanical instabilities appear or maybe to avoid them. And well, this work, as every of my conclusions says, has inspired some new work into the actual field of fluid mechanics. And at the same time, in my, in my case, I really like doing some outreach, and it's a great way to introduce fluid mechanics to the general audience, because fluid mechanics is, it can be a hard subject. I find it fascinating. But if I go into a bar and, uh, hey, I'm a fluid mechanist. <laughs> I do fluid mechanics. Oh, yeah, well, cool. But if I go into a bar and I say, hey, I do some art with fluid mechanics. Oh, what's that? <laughs> so in the end, just thank you very much for your time. <laughs> Thank you.
Council of Science and Technology in Mexico and the FONCA, which is uh, again, it's a fund for cultural research. Okay. I just don't have time to read. Yes. Um, in your talk, you said, I got here, creative coding to produce hard work, creative coding to produce experiences. But what I've seen happening with all of your stuff is using creative coding to produce insight. Well, that's a given with both of those. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Of the artist, half of the part. Of course. Yeah, yeah. definitely. 100%. I actually have a question for Bernardo. I guess I'm, is this, is this, yes? Okay. Yeah. Whoa. That's intense. Um, I just want to commend you on your way of presenting science. Um, as someone who's a science communicator, um, it's really wonderful that you have figured out a way to connect with the public. I was recently uh, presenting a panel on innovating science communication at the Canadian Science Policy Conference. And one of the things we talked about is, you know, what role does the scientist play in communicating their science in a way to engage the general public? And I know this is kind of a digression from the general conversation, but I think that just, it's, it's amazing that you have essentially nailed the very kind of nugget that goes after an emotional response from a person to really understand what your research is about. So cross panel kudos to you for that. You had a question, Lee, right? Uh, have you heard about your, the projections that you did of the mapping? And why you didn't show a video of that? Because it's so damn good, I thought maybe you wanted to keep it a secret. <laughs> <laughs> the thing about projection mapping is that the, the light the lighting is very challenging. So, and also for the performance, uh, while you're performing, you don't generally think about documentation. And if you do think about documentation, because of the lighting, it's extremely dark, and then the light itself is extremely bright. So what documentation exists is few and far between. Uh, if I had more to show, I would love to. And uh, apart from that, um, yeah, that's, that's pretty much why I do some of that. Yeah. Um, so with creative coding, you sort of have the opportunity to have, you know, an installation sort of localized thing that you have to go and see, or you have the option of putting it, you know, online. What sort of, how do you sort of choose or what you sort of, how do you sort of plan your installation? Is there an importance to like put it in a gallery or keep it more, you know, non-localized? So I think it depends on what the intent is and ultimately what the intended audience is and what platform they are using to communicate with in the first place. Um, maybe I'll use intersection as an example, the one that Owen had showed with that um, geographical component to it. Um, my hope in working with those data sets was to kind of broadcast to the public that Ontario has these incredible data sets and maybe inspire a young geographer. So in thinking about how we would want to present that, that work took on a number of different formats for a specific audience. So we once exhibited it as a light table so people could look over top of it and see it. And that was an interesting response because we heard cheering from the room in one of the multi rooms where it was exhibited. And we thought, why are people like yelling? And they were waiting for all three to match up. It became like a slot machine for them. So they were just really incentivized to stay there. I don't know, but it was just like, yeah. And it's funny, they could have asked us. I think we had 55, like we could calculate the odds of them seeing three at once, right? <laughs> <laughs> so it was it was it was kind of interesting, but but so that light table was was an interesting way of presenting it. That work went on to that was the first time we submitted something to the Toronto Urban Film Fest and making it into a film away from its algorithmic form, and 
so that was a minute film also on the TTC subway screens. And actually, it's funny, we hold the Canadian Urbanism Award twice, once for that work, and then again, two years later with Elaine. Um, and then it ended up being as part of the Scotiabank Photography Festival. So like over a million folks saw this little triptych of panels going by. And my hope is that if some kid is standing there with their parents and they start asking questions about geography, then we have nailed it for what we wanted to do with that particular work. Uh, te technically, it actually is funny because it existed as a video. So they're like, oh, we're going to show this everywhere. Okay, uh, we're gonna show it. Like it runs natively in a web browser. It's like, oh, uh, well, can you just make a bunch of DVDs and we'll just <laughs> run that? So it's interesting in terms of how you make these choices. What makes it online is you have to optimize it, right? So the 3D thing I showed you, that had a whole bunch of long audio segments, 20 minutes per number of people talking. So for that to exist online, making the, the primitive, the, the, like the, the spheres, that's no problem. But actually getting that those, those audio files up there and compressed and optimized and delivered is the real challenge in making it online. So often new projects would start locally. And then if it looks like it's something that should be shared, then you would take it and figure out how to optimize and figure out how to put it online. Hold on, thanks, Sarah. Oh, I just wanted to talk to that a little bit as well because yeah. it's something that I think about a lot, um, which is that I'm I'm forever being asked to install work at festivals and galleries, and then being like, the ideal viewer of my work is a person at home on their laptop by themselves, and trying to think of ways to translate that into a setting that is not just putting a laptop on a plinth or a table, which is a little bit underwhelming. Um, and I've done it a lot. Um, so it's, it's always this question of like trying to think around the piece of like how you might install it in a way that is conceptually in dialogue with the themes in the work. And I, I always find it like quite challenging as well. Um, but uh, an example that I think sometimes can work is um, for the clicker game that I talked about a little bit. Um, I've done installations of it that are, you know, a laptop. And sometimes you're going to a festival and it's in some city and you're like, what will they have when I get there? We'll see. Um, but sometimes you get to actually be intentional. And so in one of the more intentional installations, I like set up a cubicle. Um, and I got like a old, like a tower. Um, and I tried to make it look like a, like an office cubicle a little bit. Um, but the floor of the gallery, I got, um, sod, like live sod. Um, and so it was like, you kind of walk in, but you're like, what is this grass? And, and then over the course of the exhibition was up, the grass dies. So this is like me trying to think of like how I can pick up on the on-screen elements, but like with a physical component. Yeah, it's, it's always tough to think around that kind of thing, though. This is a question, I guess, for both uh, Sarah Kahn and Bernardo Palacios. I remember back from around 2000, there were some researchers who came up with a statistical way of distinguishing fake public paintings from real ones. And then uh, a little bit afterwards, some people who came up with a like a, a marker doodle that you could feed into this decision procedure and it would register as a genuine public. And they, I think that was maybe the first example of an adversarial image I ever saw. So I was wondering whether thoughts about this crossed your minds maybe listening to each other's presentation. That was his boss. Oh, sorry? Hello. <laughs> So I've seen two papers about it. I know the people from one of those papers. And they use different topological dimensionless numbers to characterize Pollock's painting. So if you take, uh, I don't remember the exact numbers. I think it was the Betty number and something else. And I, I'm no expert. So I just know that those numbers are to measure the complexity. And if you basically have a straight line then that has zero complexity. But if you have a cross, then that has certain complexity. And if you measure the number of crosses in Pollock, then you can characterize his, his paintings. And he more or less had a constant number of crosses on, on his paintings. This is more or less what the paper says. Uh, but if you want to, I can contact the actual authors of, of that paper 
or, or maybe just a link to the paper. <laughs> I didn't know about this example, and I think it's cool, but this is actually a question for Bernardo. Um, you know, we think a lot or talk a lot maybe about, um, you know, algorithms, machine learning, putting people out of work. How do you feel about putting painters out of work? Robot. <laughs> yeah. I get that a lot, like, hey, can, <laughs> can, so can you create a Pollock with your robot? No. Uh, that's the quick answer. <laughs> Not yet, but I'm sure with more research you might could try, you know, with some of that complexity work of the Betty numbers and topological research and maybe some actual fluid mechanical understanding in some future. I, I, I'm not thrilled about it because I just like learning the process, like learning, get get some insight which is useful to art historians to learn how painters used to work. It's not about putting paint, painters out of out of work, and and that's a thought that it doesn't haunt me at haunt me at night. Just some nights, you know. It's like <laughs> I wouldn't like I wouldn't like that. I, yeah, <laughs> basically. <laughs> I mean, we, we might actually be able to, to make a robotic uh, Jackson Pollock. It's just that Jackson Pollock came uh, many, many years ago. So we don't bore anyone. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
and a particular, you know, you, when you were really wonderful with the art board and you know, really how it can be and it's directly what they were related to as well, and, you know, they do the provenance and they, they analyze them. Um, there's a wonderful thing online, by the way, they analyze a fake Jackson Pollock, and it's really extraordinary how they go through the process, and it's, it's just incredible. But, you know, we knew how, when to start, when to stop, right, in a very simple way. Yeah, that's so related to what I was about to say, and that is that uh, you could take this three shaper idea and you could train uh, artificial intelligence to do that, and then you can have people make make it and see if there's a difference in in that result. And last question. Yeah. Just coming back to the, I think it's the clicker game uh, that Sarah you were showing, and it raised a question for me. I mean, with all of this, about the role of algorithms and human. Communication, but uh, the question it raised for me is: Can satire be expressed by an algorithm? Um, yeah, totally about that specific It's all very dark. It's intended to be satirical. Um, that's a great question. I encourage you to take up an art practice and try to answer it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I panel answer ever. <laughs> I don't know if anyone saw this, but there was um. A viral tweet recently about if you could, um, if you only, it's a Turing test, if you're taking a Turing test, but you can only use one word, I don't know if anyone saw this, like what word would you use to try to convince the judge that you were human? And the, the winner was poo, <laughs> but I really thought it ought to be satire, actually, so. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you ask Twitter a question like that, you know, what do you get? I'm sorry. Do you remember what they tried to name that boat, Sen? Yeah. <laughs> okay, I think this is the best way to finish. Thank you very much.